It's Brian Preston, the money guy. We talked about how recessions start, right? And all and and the inciting events that lead to recession are kind of unique amongst recessions. So then we got to talk about if we're going to talk about the beginning, I think what people more care about is what does the end look like? Okay, what are some things that we can think through? What are some things that we can expect? Or historically, how have recessions ended? What have been the tools that have been used to help with that? And is this time different? Or are there things unique that make that unique? This this is, I love that we titled this, Is It Different This Time? Because it, there are some unique things. Is that, I, you know, look, governments are not fast acting, but it is one of those things in the past when we hit recession status, it's not uncommon for the government to try to stimulate mm-hmm. the economy. And what do they use for this? There's really two tools that they use in their arsenal. There's lowering interest rates. Mm-hmm. We've already told you. That's kind of tough in an inflationary period. The second thing they'll do is that they will do stimulus type of legislation. And we even had a few examples of things that have been done in the past. Yeah, if you think back to the Great Recession, you know, two things that we immediately thought of were th- th- these were attempts by the federal government to hopefully pull us out of the recession. If you remember the Cash for Clunkers uh, program, this, this uh, article was from August of 2009. He signed into law a bill passed that was basically a way for people to trade in their used old vehicles for cash to get money back into the system. And then also in 2009, uh, President Obama signed legislation extending and expanding the first-time home buyer tax credit. I want to say it was like $7,500 if you were buying your first home. Again, it was a mechanism to try to get money out into the economy. Well, the problem with that is we've just come through a lot of stimulating activities by the federal government. So it seems like perhaps that could have been one of the things that's leading to the inflation we see right now. So there's a unique mandate they have of trying to hold inflation down, but also prop up economic activity. It's two forces acting in opposite directions of one another. Yeah, I think that's why this content will be so valuable is because in the past, we've kind of learned to lean into um, some of this stimulus activity. Mm-hmm. We, you know, How this recession recovery will be different is in the fact that we probably won't get the interest rate decreases we've had in the past. It's probably hard to get some type of stimulus legislation passed because we just came through the pandemic mm-hmm. where a lot of that money and resources was used. So this is going to fall more on... What are the values? What is going on in the innovation cycle and the business cycle? And do we hit a point that markets are so low in their costs that everybody cannot help but mm-hmm. just pile in to kind of see where the recovery, to see if they just take advantage of the opportunity? And, and that does tie in nicely, Bo, that historically – markets recover fast because mm-hmm. you know how this is when we hit capitulation people will sell just for the sake of comfort yep they won't care hey what does the company have i've already shared with you that look in 2008 and 9 you could buy apple for 107 to 108 dollars a share mm-hmm. when it had 70 dollars of cash per share yep. That's the point emotionally that people are like, I don't care. Get me out of this thing. And that's so you'll oversell. Just like we overbuy, we oversell. And that's why markets recover very rapidly. It's called a V-shaped recovery. Yeah, if you think about bear markets in general, the average loss that is experienced in a bear market. Now, this is data dating not just back to the Great Recession, not just back to the dot-com bubble. This is all the way back to 1950. If you look at all the bear markets that we have participated in, the average loss is about 35%, and the average length of that bear market is about 13.8 months. Now, that does not mean that this bear market is going to go down 35%, and that does not mean that this bear market will last exactly 13.8 months. But the averages do give us an idea of what it looks like over the long term. Some are longer and more severe, some are shorter and less severe. What's also interesting when it comes to the averages is to think about, okay, when it does turn. And by the way, none of us know that it's turned until after the fact. That's none true. of us, you know, a lot of people are saying right now in the chat, and this is what's great about having a live chat. Oh, look, hey, we're in the reco- we're in the bear market recovery. It's happened. Last week, the market made 6%. It's begun. We don't know. Nobody knows. You never actually know until after the fact. But this is what we do know when we are able to put on our hindsight as 2020 glasses and look backwards. That on average, in the first month after the bottom of a bear market, the market makes back 
14.76% on average, almost 15% in the first one month. So as we get into that capitulation stage where people say, hey, I can't handle it, I can't take it, I just need to sit, sit on the sidelines and wait for this to recover, that is actually your point of maximum financial opportunity. The worst thing that you can likely do is miss out on that quick rebound. Yeah, I, I think a little historical context could also help mm-hmm. is because you just said a key point. I remember um, 2008, 2009, the Great Recession was pretty intense. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of people, you need to be careful. This is We won't know. Hopefully... Hopefully we are in full recovery. We don't know until Bo said it right, until after the fact. And I have uh, just a perfect example of this. President Obama was elected, if you remember, in November of 2008. And there was a sense of optimism right after he got elected. And and the month of December for the financial markets made between 11 and 13 percent right after. And that's right in the middle. But if you remember, the capitulation or the actually lowest of low points in the Great Recession was actually March of 2009. Three, so three the, months after that positive December. So I love, and we made 6% last week. It felt great. Maybe we're part of unloading that rubber band where it's now the energy's going up. But don't count on that. We're not timers. I'm just telling you, know what to prepare for. Know what's going on. Because This could be a false Mm -hmm. recovery, and we just haven't reached that full capitulation. But it doesn't matter if you're doing this right, because realize that rubber band effect, the energy is being built. And if we do go through another downturn, like if you go back to that 2009, like I said, we had the run-up in in December of 2008, 2009, we fell all the way back down to lows. That built up such tremendous mm-hmm. energy that l- compare this. We know after 12 months, historically, it's 43.51% from the bottom of the market. The 2009 recovery from that March of 2009 to all the way out to the next 12 months was over 60%. Mm-hmm. So the deeper you pull the rubber band, the more energy is building. But be careful trying to think, hey, we survived, we made it over, because maybe we're just in the middle of the eye of the storm right now and it feels calm and there's more to come. If you do this plan right, it's not going to matter because you're already prepared. Now, look, in, in reality, we would never tell you, oh, well, just ignore what's going on. But again, in the life chat right now that's going on, and I love that you guys are interacting with one another, people are saying things like, hey, I'm just blindly putting my money in, I'm not paying attention, I'm burying my head, I'm doing that. I don't think that's the worst strategy in the world, to not let yourself watch the account every single day, watch the market every single day. So long as you can control it, if you can continue to put your money to work, your future self will thank you. And again, remember how I talked about for our clients, when we show them performance, we show it to them over the long term because we want them to focus on the big picture. Well, when you think about the market as a whole, it's no different. Daniel put together this great illustration showing the history of bear markets and the history of bull markets from 1957 all the way through now, all the way through present day. And what it shows is, is how severe or how positive is the bull market and how severe is the bear market and also the length of time. How long does it last? Well, if you can step back and see, okay, yeah, bear markets are painful for a moment, but they are relatively brief in nature. And bull markets, they tend to last for a long time and a lot of money can be made. So when you look at this big picture, are you really frightened and really afraid of these small blips? Or are you much, 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 much more excited about these huge opportunity that exists over the long term. Yeah, I would encourage if you're if if you're listening to this on podcast, you've got to go to our website, moneyguy.com. You've got to go see if you can see this visual that we put at the uh, on this show. And by the way, we'll try to get this out on some of the social media platforms sure. too because it is just so powerful because it gives you context. I think w- when you look at this and you and you get context of what does the recession of the pandemic look like? Guys, you can barely see. I mean, you it. Can't in the context even see of what, even though it was a thirty-four to thirty-five percent loss in the markets, it looks like a blip on here, both from a time as well as a total comparison of value lost. The same thing happens because I, I thought it was also interesting. Interesting is that every one of these bull markets is listed in terms of years. Mm-hmm. You can't say that about bear markets. Nope. Now, yes, there are a few. They're the exception, though. Carry on for years, 
The majority are months. Yep. So we, we the, the good news is, and this is what I always like to give the context of, the if you've looked at where the thumb on the scale is, it's in favor of long-term investors. Right. You're not in a bad proposition. When I hear people say investing is like gambling, I'm like, you're kidding me? I'm like, it's nothing. If it was like gambling, you're <laughs> yeah, the casino. I was say, if you're the house, it you're, is. You're like the house gambling. in this thing because it is so bent in your favor mm-hmm. if you will just stay the course and not get caught off guard. And, and I couldn't remember if it was in our private Facebook group because we did a recent um, live stream with our private All Facebook group. All of our crew members get private All but, or if it was in a comment somewhere else, but somebody was saying, "Man, I'm just I'm dreading doing my net worth statement because of the losses." And that's why I would encourage everybody know yourself. Mm-hmm. If you're the type of person that if you do your your net worth statement um, monthly, uh, but you know right now while we're in this type of economic uncertain time, potentially facing a recession, that you potentially could hurt yourself by seeing that feedback. Don't do it. Do it like Bo and I once a year. Once a I mean, because that's the thing is that I, I think that a lot of people, and also when you do input that number, if it is lower, it might be concentrated. You know, I always, you know, I grew up as a kid of the, 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 the eighties where orange juice was it? you didn't go to the orange juice aisle and just pick up a gallon of orange juice. You went to the freezer aisle and you bought this frozen concoction that you threw into the pitcher and then you started pouring water on it to shake it up. Well, you knew if you took a spoonful of that orange juice and con- from concentrate, it tasted like well, it just tastes complete, like orange juice. It tasted like something that might have come from your armpit more than something that was great. Whereas when you mixed it up and reconstituted, it was incredible. So there's a good chance that your portfolio right now is from concentrate, meaning that it is getting compacted down, a lot of value being built into that. And when it gets reconstituted, meaning that when the economy hits back to being full size, people aren't panicked, people aren't selling out of emotion. You're going to find that's some good taste in orange juice. Or you know what I should have done, Bo? We should have done lemonade from concentrate. There you go. So that you know when you take those that concentrated lemonade, it tastes like lemons. You know, it's going to pucker you up. We're working through this stuff, but that your portfolio might be from concentrate right now. 